All right, well, we will call this meeting to order since I think we have everything um, up and running at this point in time. So welcome. We will begin with our Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and you are a perfect echo to the choral sound of the board, Todd. <clears throat> nice. <laughs> All right, our first item, communications and communications. So, Superintendent Cole, do we have any written communications? No other written communications other than what we have. Do you have anyone visiting on Zoom? You are welcome to submit a request or a, to discuss a specific action or discussion item. Rose Ryan, sorry, <laughs> got it. All right. And uh, two point three are personnel reports. Do have anything for that? I think it's in the packet. All right, very good. So our next item then is our consent agenda. Um, we need a motion to approve our uh, board agenda from September 28th, or I'm sorry, August 25th, and um, our draft, board draft minutes. Second. And moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Can we have a roll call vote, please? Uh, Member German? Yes. I just passed by him. Member Brownell? Yes. Member Nelson? Yes. Member Coleman? Yes. Member Wilson? Yes. Member Richard? Yes. Okay, thank you. We'll jump to number four, then our reports. Uh, staff reports. Staff reports. Uh, is Director Evans up there? I'm here. Here. Okay, Director Evans, go ahead. I think you've got one or two of these and Principal Thompson on, on as well. Um, Shauna Bland is joining us for the second report. I'll start with the first one though, because it's always uh, good to reflect um, on our activities from the spring and how we were able to support our seniors from last year, and then we'll move into talking about our plans for supporting seniors for this next year. The class of 2020 had a very odd end to their school year. Uh, March 13th happened very fast, and all of our flurry of activities we typically do with seniors were definitely altered and changed. One of those activities we typically do is the senior exit survey. And Todd, if you wanna throw that up on the share screen. <coughs> The senior exit survey is uh, something we ask the students to give us some feedback on the support they received. We didn't have a very good rate of participation this year, as you can imagine, trying to get seniors to participate in a survey after they'd already basically wrapped up their school year. Um, so th this only represents about 50% of the senior class but it's on, it's on point with what we've experienced in the past. And I would say that since the senior exit survey, we've talked to a lot of our exiting seniors about their plans for post-secondary. And as you can imagine, given the state of the situation, um, many of them are choosing to stay home and attend RCC instead of going to uh, the four-year universities. Um, we will have some better data from the National Clearinghouse, Clearinghouse as soon as uh, November uh, comes. They run some reports and give us some information on what our uh, seniors from the class of 2020 are doing related to colleges. So the, the report kind of speaks for itself and I can tell you that the support that Shauna Bland gives to our kids each year, not only Shauna, but the entire team in the College and Career Center really helps students prepare for what they um, hope for post-secondary. Um, 
And so I'm going to have Shauna kind of highlight for you in the next board report. If there's no questions on this, maybe we'll just do questions um, about seniors when we're all done. And Shauna, you want to talk a little bit about what we're doing for the class of 2021? Sure. Uh, Todd, if you want to go ahead and click on the li link for that, that'd be great. Uh, first off, I'd like to say I've got a great support staff in the Career Center between College Dreams staff as well as um, the staff that we have at the high school. And the ways that we're able to support the seniors this year, even virtually, is only able to happen because we are a team that works well together and we have so many so many people willing to step up and contribute to the seniors. So. Um, if you look at this list, you'll see that the word virtual is in every single bullet point. Um, we've had, normally we meet one-on-one -on -one with each senior in person, but instead we're gonna go to a virtual platform with them, fill out a, a simple Google form. Well, it's actually not very simple. It's pretty complex Google form that will um, give us, help us track them as far as what they are doing this year and what they plan to do after they graduate. Um, so that we can make sure to get them the resources and connect them uh, with the different options that will help them in the career path that they're wanting to do. So it's a one-on-one -on -one virtual meeting, a virtual FAFSA night with the ability to have one-on-one -on -one virtual FAFSA assistance afterwards, uh, virtual scholarship workshops, virtual individual one-on-one -on -one scholarship assistance, and virtual uh, college application workshops, as well as we're already having colleges contacting us and we're starting to line up uh, virtual college visits that we'll be hosting on, I mean, kids will be able to attend it from home. So that some things may end up being better off overall as far as what we can actually reach students. I'm excited about FAFSA and being able to support students remotely in the evenings on that. Um, so often they come to FAFSA night and they get the intro, but then they're missing paperwork. Well, we're gonna have a platform now where we can set up an appointment with them in the evening when their parents are home from work and be able to have them be at home, see their screen, be able to make sure they have all the paperwork they need to easily fill out the FAFSA in order to help get financial aid for college. Um, military, we're hoping to have them virtually reach out to our kids as well as apprenticeships and we've also got a senior canvas activities tracker where we can have in in working with ashley gerard who's the senior class advisor uh, we're going to be able to offer class meetings virtually as well as share out through a calendar and through um, meetings all this information through canvas which the, hopefully they'll get pretty comfortable as well as the rest of us getting comfortable using canvas here real shortly so um, that's the main report I have on how we are able to support seniors and I'm not going to be doing all of this on my own. It's going to take a team and the team is all on board in the Career Center and excited to start reaching out to students. I'm going to add, thanks Shauna. Um, Ryan, can you speak about our uh, scheduling of seniors this year and some of the trends that we're seeing with our senior class? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, as you can imagine with the changing times that we've had, uh, Trish commented already on uh, this past, the class of 2020, making some changes in their college attend, uh, attendance plans, uh, a lot of them staying home uh, with uncertainty, some staying home and attending four-year universities from home, and some staying home and choosing to go to a rogue community college. Uh, the same for class of 2021 and that they are looking at our new comprehensive distance learning platform. They're looking at a uh, kind of compressed learning schedule that we have, the, the possibility of earning eight credits this year and uh, taking a year's worth of course in a semester. Um, and we do have each year of the last couple of years, we've seen a slight increase in students graduating at the semester early and even a few kids graduating a year early. Uh, last year we had around 25 students graduate at the semester, um, one semester early, and we are trending that same way now and actually uh, probably will exceed that number. We're having more students that said, hey, you know, I, I, you know, this is not what I signed up for. I'm, you know, I wanna finish my senior year, but um, if, if, if we don't come back to school in person, if we don't have 
school dances and athletics and so forth. Um, I'm kind of interested in, in going and starting college online. <laughs> and so we're seeing more of that. Um, I, would, I would expect us to exceed that, that 25 number. Um, and we, we can report to you what that will look like here in another week or so a little more accurately. Um, last year, I mentioned too, we had uh, about, I think almost seven, I think seven juniors that graduated a year early. Um, I don't know that we're quite at that number uh, for the class of 2022 yet. Um, but nevertheless, we're just trying to meet students where they're at. And we, of course, always ask those questions and making sure that they've thought it through and have talked with their family members. And we talk with the family with our counseling staff does as well, just to make sure it's an agreed upon um, goal of theirs. Um, but most often it does appear to meet their needs. Do you have any questions about how we're supporting our seniors? So, um, I had a question regarding, um, so in counseling the seniors, do you kind of emphasize the financial advantages of taking these college courses while they're in high school versus paying for them at a university? And just out of curiosity, um, do we know if the colleges and universities have made any kind of financial adjustment in tuition because of it being online? I'll touch on the counseling piece. And Trish, maybe you have something more on the tuition piece. Uh, we, Debbie, we do have some students that are actually duly enrolled this, this semester, too, that are taking a couple of courses with uh, Grants Pass High School and a couple of courses at Rogue Community College. So there are, are some students that are choosing to do that. Um, and, we, and yes, we do counsel them on the uh, advantages in terms of very, very inexpensive or in some cases free college opportunities at the high school. And, and that in some cases has influenced students to stay because they know that they're not going to be able to earn, that they're not going to be able to do that uh, a year from now. Uh, so that does help. And Trish, any comments on the tuition? Um, no, I, I would. Uh, no, no comments on the tuition, but comments on our, uh, you know, in this virtual world, we are still kind of working through the impacts with our dual credit articulation. Um, colleges have certain expectations and what we're able to achieve. We're expecting a little bit of a, a down a downturn in our ability to offer credit this school year um, because we're unable to meet the college requirements. Most notably, I would say in our CTE programs is where you're gonna see a lot of loss of um, opportunities for the dual credit classes um, because they just, we can't meet the number of hours that, they're, that they need to have and the rigor they need to have in order to um, earn those credits in those classes. We've been able to, in, course, in our core subjects, um, teachers have worked with their uh, RCC partnerships or their SOU partnerships to come up with solutions. And both of those colleges have worked really well with us in core content areas. And so um, we, we're, we'll see about the same number in those areas, but we do expect a little bit less for our CTE dual credit offerings. Um, I think the other part of your question, Debbie, was about what we're hearing from universities, and Shauna can correct me if I'm wrong, but no, there has not been a change to the cost of uh, tuition for our students, even though it's all online and virtual. Um, I'm sure you've read, and I, I, I definitely cannot articulate this very well because I'm not especially uh, astute on the Oregon Promise, but we do know there was a huge impact to the Oregon Promise Grant for our class of 2020 um, and the dollars that the government had set aside for the Oregon Promise were not available. So we do have a lot of students going to RCC that will have to incur costs um, as that uh, funding opportunity uh, went away for this year. And I haven't heard the status of it. Shauna, have you heard anything different about tuition for colleges and universities? Nothing on tuition. I just heard on SAT, ACT test requirements have been loosened or not, they're not as, 
there's very few colleges that are saying, yes, absolutely, you're going to need that in order to be admitted in the next year. Most of them are backing off of the SAT, ACT requirement. That's the only communication I've had. I'll make a comment. I was in a meeting two weeks ago with the president of RCC and SOU, um, and there is no tuition bracing for their traditional students. I do have a couple questions. Um, just briefly, I appreciate the survey results. Uh, how many graduates do we have in the class of 2020? Or how many total students did we have in the class of 2020? And how many actually graduated now that we finished the summer and hopefully have a final count? Yeah. Um, I do not have that exact number for you right now. Um, I do know, given the circumstances and the grace that we were able to do as a state this spring that we will see a higher graduation rate than we have seen in the past. Um, uh, but it was a lot of push and pull. I think we had over 400 graduates and almost all of them made it. Uh, I know we had about 35 GED students that did not have an opportunity to finish um, and probably about 10 students that did not meet graduation requirements. So that's a lot better than our usual trend. But like I said, there was a lot of flexibility and grace given from the state and from the district in terms of meeting the graduation requirements. Trish, this is Member Wilkins. Did you say at the beginning that the senior exit survey was only representative of about 50% of the graduating class? True. Ta Tanya might have the exact number. She actually compiled that. But I think it was about half is what we figured. Right. Well, I'm just, I was counting up the number of uh, top 10 schools for transcript requests, which I guess would be the most, because that's not part of the survey, so that would be coming from the school district, there's 163. Well, and they can yeah. select multiple, multiple okay. schools. I'm trying to get a, a, an idea of how many of the graduates are really going up to college if the survey only captures 50% of the kids. What, do we have a sense of how many of, of the 2020 classes going off to a two-year or four-year school and how many are not? We'll be able to give you an actual number probably around November. That's when the National Clearinghouse um, data comes out and I will plan a board report that gives you a more accurate number. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, I just have a quick question for Shauna um, on the support for seniors. Uh, it looks like there's a lot of good stuff for them to take advantage of. And uh, the last thing on that list talks about activity tracking. And I'm wondering, uh, is that more of kind of like a, like a calendar for everyone to know when everything's happening? Or is that like more of an active thing where staff can keep track of what opportunities that uh, seniors are taking advantage of? Um, that's more going to be the, a calendar for the students to access through the Canvas uh, in order for them to even have in one spot, not just a calendar of when things are happening, but also the code, Zoom codes or Google Meets or Big Blue Button, whatever platform ends up working the best for them to be able to log on and have it get right in on the meeting. The only other activity tracking that we do is the students do track their volunteering activities and we help them um, keep track of that in order to put that into scholarship applications and college applications, the different volunteer hours that they're tracking. So, Okay, I'm just curious if there's any other kind of tracking for seniors. Um, just, just, to, just so staff would know uh, students that maybe aren't taking advantage of these things, so there could be maybe a little more proactive outreach to those students? It's, it's something we can definitely look into to see the actual numbers of who who's logging on to different activities, and then between myself and my staff, and as well as the senior advisor, um, we could definitely reach out to students and encourage them more on that. This is like Brownell coming up. Um, so looking a little bit closer at the students' rate career development, what exactly is sort of senior career narrative? Is that like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Or what is, what is that? That's basically a, 
in the past, it's been a, uh, a, a paper that they write that reflects on where they've been and where they want to go. They, um, they look at what classes they've taken, what they want to do within the next five years, and what they want to do further down the road, and kind of map out that plan of how they're going to get there. So it's, 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 it's kind of a fun activity that a lot of them dread, but then they do it and they realize, oh, that was actually a, a good experience. So that's, that's what Career Narrative is. Uh, I just wondered that the, the biggest um, column in the not helpful category, so I wondered about it. This member Richardson, um, Trish, if we can't offer what's needed for the CTE so that they can have the college credits for those classes. How are the colleges offering those credits? I mean, are they able to get the students the class time they need? I'm not sure I can really speak to it because I just, I know anecdotally um, what our what our RCC partner was able to share. There will be some open labs. They'll be following certain safety protocols. We are, we are still working on it. I will tell you that for this quarter, it's a lot more of a challenge as we try to get this comprehensive distance learning thing off the ground. Um, we are talking about some limited in-person opportunities for our CTE students that might allow us, um, depending on how the, next quarter goes and and how we're able to um, partner with the colleges we've talked about utilizing their labs as well so we're still exploring some options but it's it, it's just not an easy fix is that because the state is limiting our access to our facility yeah. uh, yeah, we can only have limited in person based on the metrics on our campuses. And is this something, is this in the healthcare field, the childcare field, the well being? What, what exactly are we talking about when you say CTE? Uh, healthcare um, is uh, the certifications. If Jeannie Kenyon were here right now, she'd tell you how difficult this year is going to be to get the certifications and the credit. Uh, early childhood is also struggling mightily with covering the, the breadth and the practicum hours students need to earn certain credits in their program of study. Um, our metals fabrication class uh, needs kids actually in the lab welding. Um, our wood shop uh, we actually, we don't have a lot of credits in our wood shop, but in our uh, manufacturing program with Brenda Bungie, we have some credits that we, I think she's going to be able to make it work in her program of study. It just kind of depends. I, I know that health sciences and early childhood are, are hugely impacted right now. Thank you. So, um, this is member Richardson, Shauna, the virtual one-on-one -on -one for FAFSA and that kind of thing. I mean, that sounds really good. Um, kind of something you almost wish you could have all the time, but maybe virtually as a way to keep everybody from traveling, maybe we can get more people to participate. Um, but one thing about the college part for juniors and seniors, again, it would be a new thing but we've often talked about how many credits our students earn while they're at Grand Pass High School, and they tend to not get them in the right buckets for what they're gonna do in the future. But now that there's much stronger emphasis on online college stuff, um, maybe we can do a better job of helping them align those credits and possibly even start their online college career when they're juniors. Um, so anyway, it's something that you guys might look at. 
We actually are. We actually do have a number of students who will be taking um, online classes through RCC and SOU this term. But we're still we're, It's de definitely something we're still working on. But I, I just wanted to let you know we are we're trying to make some things happen on that front. And we did find this spring there were a few seen last year's seniors this spring that we uh, helped fill out their FAFSA. Uh, remotely and we really enjoyed the process because like we said before there's always paperwork that they seem to leave behind and it was was a very useful tool that I think we will use moving forward even when we can have in-person uh, visits we will give it an option at least to also have a virtual thank you great thank you uh, summer school summary report yeah um, we had a lot of summer activity um, trying to help our students um, in a lot of different kinds of ways. Some of them are things we've done in the past and some of them were new things we tried this year because of um, the circumstances. The first part of the report is our we still are offering um, a number of online classes. These are our teacher created courses for Career Academy, personal training and wellness. We had about 135 students participate, which is pretty much what we have every summer in these four classes. This gives, you can see that the bulk of the students who take advantage of these classes are freshmen. And a lot of them are trying to um, open up their schedule for various courses that they want to take at the high school. And so it's, it still continues to be a strong option for students. Um, the Career Academy note is just that students still are not done in that class. They have some other work they have to do um, this fall. And so we'll continue to track on that, but our outcomes were pretty good. I'm always surprised at the number of Fs that we, <coughs> excuse me, continue to have. We really try to emphasize with our parents and students that this is a rigorous course. You have a lot of work to do and a number of students just did not get it done again. The, the total number should be eight down there at the bottom. But if you scroll uh, down a little bit, um, we've done Gladiola Summer School for a number of years, but it had to look a lot different this year, as did our other summer school activities. Um, per the state guidelines, we were only allowed to have 10 students with one teacher. Um, teachers could move, but we had to keep stable cohorts of 10 students. So uh, for Gladiola Summer School, we were only able to accommodate a total of 20 students um, for the entire summer, which typically we can get up to about 35 in Gladiola Summer School, but it just, we, we weren't able to achieve that this year given the restrictions um, for cohorting. Um, Jalen Dinkins and Gary Miller did a fantastic job. I'm sure at some point, Kelly Marvel will share with you all the duck pond that's been built in the Gladiola Garden as a result of that summer school, as well as some other um, projects and work that the students did in that summer school. For ELA summer credit retrieval, that being our language arts, and then the EL summer credit retrieval, as well as the RR, RR summer credit retrieval stands for resource room. So this past spring, we had a number of freshmen, sophomores, and juniors who are now 10th through 12th graders who did not pass their spring quarter credit course. Uh, per the state guidelines, we had to come up with a plan for each individual student for each course that they did not pass, and that was called a credit assurance plan. Um, those credit assurance plans, there's about 650 of them that we need to work on accomplishing this um, school year. We have until September of 2021 to try to assist those students in recovering that quarter credit that they lost. Um, and a lot of it was just not being engaged, not doing the work, um, not responding to the teacher and turning, turning in the requirements for the course. So uh, our language arts teachers, three of them, um, because the bulk of the credit was lost in language arts, um, which is 
pretty typical as well. Um, if you look at our credit retrieval needs, language arts tends to be the highest with math being second, but the um, teachers were able to work with 10 students in each one of their cohorts, so a total of 30 kids. We were able to um, recover a half credit for some of those students because of the work and activities the teachers developed. We ran two different sessions during the day for each of those three teachers. So um, we were able to really get a number of students um, and I just really want to give a lot of credit to Mrs. Connolly, Mr. Kellogg and Mrs. Watson. They did an excellent job. Our EL summer credit retrieval was our second language um, program coordinators, Tim Bartelt and Jorge Padilla. They too ran two different sessions and they were able to really support a number of students getting their credits caught up or completed. And then uh, John Musser was able to work with some of our special ed students on modified diplomas who um, also needed to recover some credit. So th the bulk of that work was about credit retrieval we also do, um, beyond those students who were all in person on site at Grants Pass High School during the month of July and August, we also ran our typical online credit retrieval program where we had 138 students participate um, and 70 credits were recovered, half credits were recovered by those 138 students. So it had some pretty good outcomes, but we know we have a number of students with some pretty big hills to climb um, in order for them to graduate this year. So we are working really intentionally um, targeting our seniors and um, you know, today was our first day of school and it did not go, it, it was great at secondary. We had some good, th good outcomes, but we have a number of students we need to follow up and make sure how do we get them engaged so they um, continue to get the credit they'll need in order to graduate? So we have our work cut out for us this month, but we are ready and excited about our outcomes from this summer. Thank you. Just one question. What is the game plan for a teacher who doesn't have students that are participating? I mean, are they to call the parents or have, has the school district walked through a protocol to help a teacher engage with their students that may not be showing up? Or what do we do in that situation? Do we have the, do we have the attendance folks calling or I guess it's just what's the protocol or the policy? Yep. Um, first off, we need to get our attendance system to work right. And today we had a few glitches with that. But um, it's a whole different um, method and system. We do have, the high school has already um, gotten together with, we, we have some community partners as well as our staff who are going to be reaching out. We know who the kids are that didn't engage last spring. So we've already been making phone calls, trying to reach out to them, trying to develop relationships, um, remove barriers such as internet connectivity or devices that they might need in order to do the work. Um, it all starts with a relationship with the teacher though. And I gotta tell you, there was some really cool stuff happening on Canvas today with high school teachers and their students, um, as well as middle school and elementary. Uh, but thinking about that need to graduate, need to engage as a high school student, um, it's how, how uh, the teacher brings them into this virtual classroom and builds that relationship with them. And so we have a big focus on that this week. And it will be the very first point of teacher reach out. Do you know what's going on for this kid? Our attendance folks will be making phone calls uh, daily as well. Um, and then we have a team ready to do some door knocking and home visits uh, to help remove barriers going forward. Can't we have the governor as part of her executive order to shut off their cell phones during the time? <laughs> <laughs> we can yeah, try. We'll get their attention. <laughs> yeah, but they're FaceTiming and helping their... Well, as long as they're part of the system, everything's good. They don't show up. So you they're want your big brother to watch even more closely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Trish. Uh, no, we do not have that. We have, any, we, we have not filled that position. We're retooling uh, 
in terms of yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, Four point two superintendent reports. We're going to talk about our quarterly review of our strategic plan, which is found on our report section. So, um, shared the draft of it and attempted uh, 2019 20 will go down as a big asterisk year, I think, in terms of data overall. Um, there are a number of places in here where uh, data has not been collected because I, um, watching the director team do what they've been doing for the past month, um, felt like this is a working document that we can fill in as we move forward and in, in filling in some of these data pieces. Um, and so just kind of going down here um, and looking at each of the objectives of what we're trying to do and talking about what would be collected for data. So in the first uh, row, um, it's the, it would be the number of staff being trained in each of these and the number of students possibly being impacted. For example, Discovery is the alternative education program that we uh, did a middle school pilot on this year. Um, and so that one would have a number of students impact. And positive discipline is a classroom management training for staff that has uh, some uh, is known to have very good results. And so we were pursuing those pretty heavily. Just the training on, on the number of staff in these other uh, professional development areas is the type of data we can collect and we can then reference the percent of our staff that are equipped with the tools that go into this professional development. Number of behavior referrals, that's the next one. Definitely. Can I ask you a question? Yes. So how many of our staff do we have a goal to be trained? Is it 100%, is it half? For ACEs, it's 100%. Uh, ideally, positive discipline will get to a, a point at which that could be 100%. Um, the positive discipline model we're working on is to develop in-house experts in that training um, for neurosequential development. Uh, um, that was kind of a school by school choosing to go down some of those modules and pathways. Again, this is all centered around the brain and, um, and that. Uh, adverse childhood experiences, it's our goal that every new staff member, every staff member be trained in the basics of, of ACEs and, and uh, child development. So would that be the goal then? Could, we, could I write down 100% for ACEs and 100% for adverse childhood experience? And and that positive discipline, the, uh, we look at it from a school to school basis. Yeah. To say like we have five leaders in each school or whatever, whatever it should be. Yeah, that is, that would be a really good way to look at that. And um, uh, so Redwood is, is one of two elementaries uh, that we've stepped up to be a pilot for this new training model that they're trying to do. So the other one is one of the schools in Medford. Um, and Christine Mooney and her staff have really embraced the training they had last year and um, are diving in deeper this year and they'll ultimately become kind of a model that will build up for our other schools. So are we still doing CLEAR? We, no, we're no longer doing CLEAR. That was through Dr. Blodgett at WSU. Um, and um, it, to be frank, it's very expensive and, and the, the amount of staff buy-in. So Lincoln uh, was the only school that completed three years. Um, Todd, do you want to fill in any other blanks on clear? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, real expensive uh, per building each year. Uh, after year two, so we had a lot of schools that did two years of it, the year three becomes reinforcement. And so the staff felt like they could take it and run from that point. And that's truly an option for all schools. Uh, the first year is a lot of uh, that uh, beginning groundbreaking sorts of things on how the brain works and then how to start using tools in the classroom and doing the coaching. Year two is quite a bit more application of those tools with the coaching. And then year three really is sort of custom design, however you want to do that. But a lot of schools that chose to do the positive discipline because of the practical aspect of all those tools. And so they could start taking the brain science, the coaching, and then use the tools that come with positive discipline. It all works together really nicely. Uh, Jody McVitie, Dr. McVitie, who does the training here locally for positive discipline is very much aligned to the brain science, the trauma-informed practices, even the neurosequential model. So all these things, all these tools align very nicely. And then ideally, if we're doing that first one well, the next the next one will see uh, changes in discipline referral rates. 
And there's an asterisk here because we were out of school in the middle of March, so I only put in the data from um, beginning of the year to the end of February, which we can go back in our system and pick that data up for that given amount of time. Ideally, we'll get the full year data as we carry this out over multiple years. Um, the next is the targeted transition activities. I just put the list of things we offered and the actual number of participants, both staff and students, is to be collected. I'll ask Susan of that after uh, to get that official data after we get elementary up and started, and she isn't so concerned with that. Um, and as well as Trish with the um, eight to ninth uh, activities. Um, the last one on that page um, is targeted interventions, so uh, data to be collected. Um, number of students impacted by stepping stones that transition back to classrooms. This year we're not running stepping stones. We had to make some decisions about staffing and programs. Um, and so we're not running stepping stones this year, so there's an asterisk next to that one. IPNs are individual planning meetings, so that would be the number of individual behavioral planning meetings uh, for students um, by school. We can track that at the elementary level, and then we have uh, some newer systems in place at the middle school as well. Um, Discovery, the pilot we talked about, um, obviously that's being put on hold this year to run additional sections of that. Um, and we did add social emotional counselors to the two middle schools um, and then added another one at Grant Pass High School um, and then Gladiola some additional counseling there. Um, so that's really just we're adding this resource. Hopefully the impact is really going to be up here. Um, in terms of behavior referrals and student engagement, attendance, and all of those things that are also later in this plan. And so uh, if you flip that over, um, another uh, asterisk it's going to be for this year is we do not and I'm, uh, plan to roll out the Youth Truth Survey this year and put that on hold again. Um, uh, so, um, that is the tool that we have used uh, now for two years, 18, 19, and 1920, for our secondary schools for school climate surveys. We don't have a tool that we use at the elementary level, um, and that's something we could explore further. But uh, the way the data there is collected is a five-point scale on a number of questions in each of these categories, and uh, fours and fives are positive responses according to the, the way they report the data. And so you can see um, how students are feeling around culture, belonging, uh, relationships, belonging, peer collaboration at the respective secondary school. Is, is truth is the only thing that we use? Yeah. Um, are there I, integrated lessons at the elementary and middle? There isn't uh, to, to collect survey data on students climate perceptions of school. Is there curriculum type things on culture and safety um, and feeling supported? Uh, we have a, a behavior curriculum that teaches social emotional skills that every teacher uh, rolls out lessons for. Um, and so the data to collect, it's expected that teachers are teaching that okay. curriculum, all teachers are. So. I just worry that we put a lot on one survey. Yeah, and I think we can use the, they changed it again, another another tool that the state changes is the, uh, uh, Trish, what's the name of the new uh, teen survey that the uh, Oregon Department of Ed has said, we're just going down this one? Uh, it's the uh, student health survey. I'll be reporting on it in October to you guys. So the student health survey, that's a, a new refined tool, but that's only issued at uh, two, uh, two separate grade levels. Um, so, um, trying to find tools that capture these things is, is challenging, and then like this year with the way the current conditions are, that survey is always given in the fall, and we don't have kids in school this fall, so we put that on for another year. But it is, a, it is a tool with a lot of data that we can mine and use on a number of levels, and, and, and you'll see that reflected in a couple of others. So, if I look at some of these, I mean, our 
I guess you'd call it, uh, if you look at the breakdown of our students, our cultural positive ratings are actually lower than all of our minority students. So they could all be having a 100% negative view. And we can actually break it down by some demographic data in terms of the responses. So um, I'll dig deeper into that, but I believe yes, the answer is what you said. That would be bad. That would be bad. So um, I'll, I'm going to dive into that a little. There's a lot of data in there, and we can disaggregate uh, on some level. Yeah. And it's an online survey? It is. It is an online survey. So you could have them take it. Even though they're not in school, you just to get a sense of where things are at. Yeah. Well, well, Trish, let's talk about that a little bit more tomorrow if you want. Only from a standpoint, it would be fascinating to see how they feel things are going as we get yeah. to the school year. We are actually administering the Youth Truth Survey in March to North and South Middle School. Um, for Grants Pass High School, it's just there's, it's, we've made the decision we're not going to give it this year at Grants Pass High School, but we um, are giving the Student Health Survey. Okay. And as Kathy uh, noted, I mean, three of our items for uh, grounding practice and equity and inclusive practices all that's the only information we get is that use truth survey for my eight there's a lot of eggs in one basket. Um it's not a lot of like community response. If I remember correctly last year it was like hundred and thirty seven parents took it. Uh, I'd have to look at what the raw number is for parents. It's a question um, how yeah, and then that's the tough part about, and, and so, you know, you got to look at it through that lens or yeah. that filter. Um, you know, when you send surveys out, we send surveys out that we have in the past, 15 to 20 percent response rate is doing well, typically, um, and asking people to do that on their time at home. So that's that's a difficult thing to gauge, um, so we're going to have to fall back to Scott's model. Right? The goal changes from whatever the results are, so the goal is trying to get 100% of the doctors to answer the survey. <laughs> it was just 80. So I struggled to get that. <laughs> that was, so that was the goal. It, it was, you're right. I mean, the goal was, the goal had to change. It wasn't even what the doctor said. That was the least concern. It was just, let's just find out where we stand, and then we'll have to come up with some metrics after that. And I think, you know, if you look at these types of things, I don't, we know that the response rate is poor. I look at our scores, you know, the culture 30, I mean, everything is below 50, the 50th percentile or 50 percent. And, um, but I don't know what that means. I mean, what does that really mean? It's hard to, it's hard to make any rational decisions based on that. And so maybe the goal is just to have greater participation amongst parents and students as the only measure that we're looking at. We have really good participation amongst students. Um, because we schedule it for them and give them time in the day. Yeah. With parents, I think that would probably be more appropriate as that type of goal is just to increase the response rate. Another piece of information that's on here that I find interesting, under staff demographics, we have Hispanics 3%, but we had a report done by an attorney and when he went through the stuff, he had zero identifying Hispanic. So out of those two numbers, uh, that's a really good question. And I questioned that uh, when that report came out. And so um, this is from our information system. So how that attorney got that data, I'm not familiar with. You can ask him. <laughs> and if it's screwed up, you should get a correction. Do we know why the youth truth survey data is different on the first one and the third one? Am I reading that wrong? Well, first, under yeah, North Southern right. School, on the very top, it's 46 percent for culture, and on the third line, it's 53 percent for culture. Um, so there's there's students, staff, 
and the parents, although it's, uh, there, there are three different groups of people. Um, so um, I still need to collect data on the staff retention, um, and, and so work with HR on that. But, uh, HR's been a little busy lately, too, um, as you'll hear in the second session. So you can see, and the other thing that they call a positive is a four or a five. And, you know, three is right in the middle, it's very neutral. So um, we don't have data on what how many threes there were necessarily. I think we might be able to break it down that far, but I spent about half a day in the data trying to mine. The yeah. Answers. Yeah. Did we earlier this year get a report on the on this youth truth survey data? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So there was, there was a report. Um, it, it was it was very narrowed uh, in terms of uh, what we shared because there's so much, and so we just tried to take some highlights then. Any other questions on that page? And then the last page, um, again, there's more data to be collected here in terms of avid walkthroughs and how we're scoring there and the increase of uh, number of teachers avid trained. We can get that information. Um, and then teacher observation data, that's just how many observations were conducted. Um, what a walkthrough is. A walkthrough, avid walkthrough, so uh, Trish can speak to it really well, but what you you visit classrooms in the school from both avid trained teachers and, and not avid trained teachers, and you're looking for evidence of wicker, um, and, and Trish can go, if you want to know more, and go deep into it, but it's evidence of strategies being utilized in the classroom to determine a score established by avid. And so um, the more we do better PD and AVID school-wide and uh, uh, PD, um, district-wide PD, and uh, the more we should see these strategies being utilized in the classroom, which are, are really shown to garner great results. Yes. Um, so uh, third grade reading, we have two Two pieces of data we can look at, and Susan can speak more to it if you have questions, but we have Acadians, formerly known, you've heard it over the years, called Dibbles. It has now changed hands in who runs it. It's called Acadians. And that we were 73% of kids have benchmarked or above. 2018-19, you'll see that number on here a lot because 1920 data is not available. We didn't take state assessments this last spring. Um, so when you see state assessment data, um, <clears throat> that's uh, one of those asterisks that are out there. Mm. So going down to the math data, again, you can see. Um, and then looking at tools that we are getting better at tools for interim assessments that um, I would like to add to this, working with uh, the curriculum directors and make that kind of a three times a year uh, report as well. Um, on track for graduation, like Trish said, uh, you will <clears throat> um, have some updated data on how students are doing for 1920, but this is where we were in 1819. You can see our regular tender rate. We'll get a new regular tender rate. I don't know what kind of asterisks they're going to put on that as well state level, um, but we can monitor regular tenders and we have interim reports we'll be able to give in December, March, and June, and then come back um, in the fall, hopefully with a more established year-end summary. Um, dropout rate, that's an annual report configured by the state. The four-year cohort and five-year completion rate, those are established by the state, so we will get older data that um, uh, we'll be sharing later this spring when it all becomes official, but as um, Director Evans indicated, we anticipate it to look really good in terms of the grad rates. On the graduation rate, that's our actual number or that's our target? Um, um, so our, our target is over here on the far left. 
Okay. Those were actual, those are actual, actual yeah, yeah. So okay. this really is intended to be baseline. Here's what we know, and we're trying to move the needle on these things. Um, going down to, I haven't had a chance to sit down with Sherry to talk about how best to quantify safety. Before we leave the uh, academic stuff, I'm really struggling with some of our <coughs> goal things. Um, particularly, there's the issue of one year of crummy data. Um, one class of students will be really strong academically, the next year not so much. And so it looks like you didn't make your goal. And then the following year, there's the reversion to the mean, right? And you get a better class and, ooh, it looks like you're, you're really doing good this year. That is not the way for us to tell that we're making progress on a year by year basis because a cohort of students is too different from each other unless you're going to some kind of way start statistically giving us a band for uh, the range of each cohort. Um, so maybe we should be using a moving average and saying that our goal is that the moving average is moving up every year and that way as you have these experiences between classes, that can smooth out so we can tell are we trending up or are we flat or are we trending down. But measuring year to year, you just can't tell anything really. Do we see much variance from the year to year basis on things like if an eighth grade math scores? I mean, is there truly a, a wide swing in how we do it? Not a wide swing, but there's, there are those years where it is a misgrade, but if we continue to refine our systems, we should be able to see consistent growth. If we continue to refine our systems, our strategies, our instruction, et cetera, we should be able to see. Now, a lot of these, these this, is, this is what we have to report to the state, and that's how they're looking at it, so that that's how we're seeing. We've had many discussions that we don't really care what we report to the state, we're looking for a measure that tells us that District 7 is doing better. We can, well, but you have to have someone be collecting that. I mean, how do you do that in a realistic world? Like, you have to have someone who would then do nothing but collect that data for us. I mean, so how would you propose to do something like that? Well, you can't rely on the state to collect that data for you because they just up and throw it out and switch to a different standard, and then you have no historical data. Is that right, Trey? Uh, sounds like what you're what? asking is like for maybe like a three-year rolling average on some of these things, where we already have the data, maybe you know, but we just look at it over a three-year average as opposed to year by year to to smooth out the curve. That well, I watched it with my kids went through, and year to year, the variances were significant. In fact, one of the three is that year, the one I identified the one, <laughs> made him look really good. Oops, to the gender. But, um, yeah, that, for whatever reason, that color didn't have an extremely academically gifted color, and uh, whereas for the other two, it was much higher. And you can see that through the numbers as they flow through the system. I mean, that's just variance between the differences on the core. And we're looking to implement a system that works over time, not that we do this thing and it went up by 5%. Well, is that just because they're a better class of students? Or did we actually do something to achieve positive? change. We will see if we can refine and slice and dice and uh, try to take a look back and see what that might look like. And of course my last one is the math scores and 
since we're already kind of behind in District 7 related to math, um, is 2% really a good target until we need to get back up to as good as the rest of Southern Oregon? I think we believe that 2% is, is a good target to just try to move that needle slowly year by year um, with continued professional development, refining of our practices, um, adjusting our systems. Um, How did we get there? How did we get to the two? Yeah, how did we get so behind? Great question. I know that we've invested a lot in professional development over the last couple of years, especially at the primary level. I know Trisha's brought in um, uh, supports at the secondary level, brought teams together. It's probably one of the areas we've spent the most on PD in the last couple of years. Trying to turn that, we are seeing, we are seeing uh, definitely at the younger levels, um, uh, the third and fifth grade, we're seeing it start to really move up. And we know that you got half of your kids coming into middle school that aren't proficient in math. They're working with some challenges to say they're going to be proficient in eighth grade. So it's really a systems effort over time. And did they not get new curriculum, math curriculum? Uh, curriculum. curriculum Document here, but 
I thought I remembered somewhere in here there being a line item about working with community partners and things of that nature. Um, was that not this in this document? That was not in this document. Okay. That's on the cover page that had the pillars on it. Uh -huh. So um, yeah, it's, it's in that document. Okay. And that doesn't translate into here. It, it could. Um, how you what you would want to quantify is it the number of community partners or the number of dollars spent with community partners or I mean, it's 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 vast. When yeah. you talk about College of Dreams, Malibu Project, Parks and Commission uh, options, um, that's vast and uh, kind of bigger picture. Difficult to put it into a goal and quantify. Well, it is, but I think that it's something that can be continually improved upon, and I think that it's important that the board is apprised of the details of what's happening on that front. Yeah, I think I second what Brian said. What I had written down related to the, I don't see anything related to communications in here. And certainly um, we could get information back about how many times we met up in the community, how we reached the um, homeowner, homeowner demographic, how we reached the people about schools demographic. I mean, we have a communication plan that we showed us here and we need that. So there could be some numbers put to that um, related to communication, which I think should be in this document. Well, I do want to just say that I'm uh, very grateful for this. I know this is a lot of work, but this really is I think, a great foundation for us to, to build upon. I would echo Ryan's sentiments. I think there are things here that I would like to see, but this is a great starting document for us. I'm excited to have reports and to track these things. I would hope that I would expect it uh, sometime later in 2021, in May or June, we would revisit the whole thing and talk about what we like about it, what should be added, what goals we want to set for the next year, and we would continue to refine the document moving forward. And I think we'll discover things that work and things that don't work, mm -hmm. things that we're able to track and not track, or that the, not worth tracking, or we're not going to get any mileage out of some of the things that we're looking at, and we want to continue to refine it as we move forward. So this is a great starting point. I have a question. So we say that we want to do it quarterly, but the majority of these things are annual. So I think we are going to have to hear reports, though, about how things are going. I think there will have to be a, a wrap-up of everything at the end of the year, but I think quarterly, it's holding, it, it's that accountability piece to say we, we still remember that this is what we're working on and here's where we're at, even if we don't necessarily have a measure. Um, and I think that's probably what will have to be defined over the years as we look at things. What, what, what are going to be the best things to monitor that actually get us where we want to go and and how do we report back as we're moving forward. So I think it's a great starting document for us. I think there's a lot of work that can go into it as we move forward, but it's a great place to start. And, and I think there are additional data sources for some of these. Um, so now that we're getting school focused and on track, this will be front and center with the, the work between me and my directors. Um, and uh, informing this, um, so uh, okay. um, four point two point two budget priorities. Yeah, so I just to put this on uh, on the uh, uh, agenda because it had originally we had a. The initial budget committee meeting slated on the board calendar upcoming um, and talking with director Ely uh, right now um, this is really to just put it on the board's radar uh, I'd like to make this an agenda item for next time for the board to this for this to be a board discussion of uh, priorities of areas that you see um, you would like to see the district considering for proposed budgets in the future. And that came um, 
speak from our past chair um, to have that meeting earlier. Director Ely isn't feeling um, comfortable right now to continue and hold a full budget committee meeting, but rather begin facilitating discussions around priority, budget priorities. So, there was a number of people on the budget committee who uh, <clears throat> essentially felt that it was so late in the process and from the discussion we had the last time it clearly was too late in the process and so we said we could just have a meeting earlier this year so that we can talk about what the budget priorities should be before the budget's built, not after. So there, and, and I think we, we can do this. We can definitely start it earlier. I think to do it now is very premature given the unknowns of the COVID impact, the unknowns of the next biennium and projected funding. Uh, as those sift, sift out, they can, there'll be more information to share with um, folks. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at, we're watching enrollment really closely right now um, because we're not at the, the number we were when we left the end the school year. Uh, and so as we are tracking down kids who aren't showing up or who are not registering as homeschooled or who have not provided us notice of going to virtual academies, there's another potentially significant funding impact. And so a lot of that, a lot of discussion around priorities feels very premature and um, you know, we will have an impact because our first costs are going to go down. So there's a positive uptick in funding, but as those things start to become a little clearer and, and inform us, then kind of establishing those priorities is, is hopefully the timing of that. Um, probably looking towards uh, January and starting that process involving the budget committee and board as a whole. What does that usually happen? Um, we've, we've almost always started it after spring break with the meeting with the budget committee. So if we can get a jump start on that by January, um, you know, we never get a solid number on a budget until June anyway for the state. Um, so we're always, our, the process is really um, the way it's set up with the state and you know your funding versus what you need to do in preparation for that. You, uh, you alluded to the fact that enrollment is lower than last year at this point. Can you give us an indication of percentage lower? So what I do know is I've gotten about uh, between June and now about 100 notifications of our students who were formerly ours enrolling in virtual charter schools. Um, I think, Tanya, you look at them. 140 total. And so that's, a, that's up about 120 from what we previously had. Um, and then homeschool enrollments, we saw an uptick of probably about 100 in terms of registering as homeschooled who are formerly ours. And so right there is about 240. Um, and then um, we'll see what how the numbers sift out. It's going to be a conversation we're going to talk about tomorrow as a director team and, and where are we at? What is power school telling us right now? Um, so, so that's the sense we have. But again, like uh, Trish, Director Evans said those kids who have not filled out the online registration and did show up in their Canvas class today, you know, where are they? What are they doing? Can we recover them? Uh, the other piece is... Is it our job to recover them? Is that the appearance issue at home? Um, there is not a system of support in our area to uh, address truancy. Well, it sounds like it, there is. We have a committee to go knock on their door and make can phone I, calls. I think that, 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 is, <laughs> think that is our, our, our only We're good at camp. But this is out of a Huston. 6,000 students. How many total students? Uh, last year, um, just right near 6,200 last year at our peak. Is it um, with charter schools? I know that. That I've heard somewhere that we, you know, each school district gets to decide a percentage that they're going to let. Or as soon school. as as soon as we hit three percent of our enrollment, we can deny the the enrollments for charter schools. So if you take three percent of six thousand, as soon as one hundred and eighty students, it hits that hundred. So right now, I, I just Tony brings me a stack of papers on Monday, and I 
sign off or releasing them until we get to that mark. Because we, we have that, that percentage? No, that's set by the state. That's in state statute. Well, in our next meeting, will we have a clear, will the board be able to have a clear picture of enrollment? Yes. Okay. Yes. We'll, we'll make sure that. And addresses. I think I would note that attendance is a very nebulous thing. Mm -hmm. um, every day, the district enrollment changes. Every single day. I, okay. But it's the beginning of the year, so I'm curious what it is. Tony said there was an enrollment report ran earlier today, and it was approximately 5,300 is what we have in the So there's more. More to be found. <laughs> yeah. The other, the other piece that we need to make a long-term commitment to is when we look at um, GP Online as our largest elementary school, and basically, if, if the students enrolled in GP Online, it is no different than attending a virtual charter school somewhere else. The big difference is you'll have access to Grants Pass School District teachers, and you'll have access to Grants Pass School District activities if you enroll in our virtual. School. And so there will be a marketing piece that we will need to pursue pretty heavily uh, in, in getting these students back on our rolls. We're not we're not prepared to do that yet as we sit through and yeah. get our we gotta get good at it. As you gonna say you're behind the curve here. Good idea, but <laughs> <laughs> we have people calling all day today students who have not been registered. Okay. They were yeah. all yeah, day. I think <laughs> <laughs> well, there's plenty of uh, folks who procrastinate. If you can make a note that we'll try to give it up to the Well, of course, we so different this year. The real question is when does the state want the number which determines how much money the district receives? What's the team here? They don't count on September 8th, do they? No. No. It's an average daily membership for the school year, so at the end of the year, we'll, we'll come up with the number. So get them sooner and keep that number up. We noted that Sherry will keep a very close eye on what the other districts are, and you see that they're pulling any shenanigans with their opinion. Okay, you can't. All can't right, well, let's move on. Have have three. Three. All right. All right. Uh, board reports and special concerns are property planning committee report. And Member Durbin said she would lead this, and we, the rest of us, would back up. Yes, thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. I'm trying not to be the yelling voice from upon high, so uh, tell me if I'm being too loud. Um, but had a very uh, productive meeting with the city as part of our uh, planning committee. Um, got to talk over uh, the high level points uh, surrounded the uh, lease questions about the two parks. Um, also talked into for future partnership planning on some properties, mostly um, I think at this point, what I would s summarize the discussion around is that the city is, you know, very open to working with us um, to find creative solutions. Um, but I think we need to have a better idea of what exactly we're looking for and what we're wanting to achieve. Um, so as soon as we have an opportunity to sit down as a board and kind of understand what those opportunities might be and then prioritize those. Um, we'll have a much more productive meeting as to what they're willing to entertain or not. Um, it, but I think it's kind of up to us at this point to prioritize those ideas um, and then come up with a game plan and then, and then reach out for a, basically another check-in. Um, I thought we had a very productive discussion about the leases and understanding what the city is able to do or not do in finding terms that are agreeable to both sides. Uh, Gary, I did bring up the concern about a long-term lease being locked in and having that uh, decrease the fair market value of property should we want to sell either of the parks in the future. Um, and if they pass on the first right of refusal, um, what does that look like for a potential purchaser? Are they locked into that lease um, once the property is sold? Um, so we're pretty upfront with them and transparent about wanting to 
retain as much flexibility there as possible. Um, and so we are looking at, or Sherry is looking at and, and talking with our council, legal counsel about uh, what would need to be done, if anything, to the leases as they are to allow for um, the leases to basically not have to be fulfilled if they were sold to somebody other than the city if they decided to refuse it. Sorry, kids. Honey, I'm on the phone. Um, and then the other piece being that I asked them for the purposes of the grants, what the time frame might look like for them, what they would need in order for them to be able to apply for some of the grants to get some of the work done. And they said a 20 year lease would be what was would be required um, for that. Um, so I don't know if anybody else wants to backfill while I handle my daughter at the moment, but uh, they've been quiet this entire time. And of course it gets to the special board concerns and reports and she decides to break in. So, so actually I can, uh, I wound up talking to Tyler Fleming and to Valerie Lovely um, from city council. Um, pretty much they echo what Casey said, although there was, um, I think it was two years ago, with the board that we were looking for an additional school site where the city had 160 well units ish that they're trying to have south of town. And um, they said that. They understood the need for that and thought that should be a topic of discussion with the district sometime in the January, February timeframe. They have a transportation study that's coming out this month and the county has a transportation study that's coming out, I think, later this month. They're not positive on that part. In any event, once the uh, that was kind of Valerie talking that once they had their transportation plan, that then it becomes a better time to discuss school locations and things of that nature. Um, and I sort of asked, well, what does it take to keep something like that on the city radar? Because it's a big deal to us, but not really to them. And um, so the, the two park properties that we have are sort of our way of keeping their attention focused on getting us a school site in that area. So they seem receptive to talking about that. And it is looked through the park master plan and there's, um, they do talk about cooperative property acquisition and if we were to acquire a site in that new area it's certainly future for district seven so it could be part of their park usage for 20 to 40 years until the area builds out we would actually move the school there so there is some good discussion that we can have with the city Where are you talking about? As a possible school site? I have no site. So I, I, I don't know that uh, uh, those plans or conversations have had uh, a lot of air time with the city. Um, so um, I'm, I, there's a property um, behind like uh, where Allen Creek meets Harbeck. Um, and there's large uh, private pro properties back there. And so there's consideration that somehow that land might be acquired to provide um, uh, affordable housing, essentially, and upwards of 660 units. But I don't know how public the city has been about that. And um, because I haven't seen anything, I 
was aware of this probably almost two years ago, shared a meeting with the city. Um, I know there were some initial thoughts or conversations. Um, and with uh, Rich Ford, I believe, was part of those conversations as well. I recall some of those when I first came on. Yeah. I mean, future it's, it's, it's about the city having to, to make some moves mm -hmm. to, for that to happen. But. And I think giving them enough time to do that. Well, the transportation issue when we did our bond to ask was uh, at least in some quarters a hot topic of discussion. So certainly once the city and county got new transportation plans, that would give us some information and probably not the right time, but we're doing a transportation something out of regular. I haven't heard a report back. Yes, I am on, but I can't hear you, Gary. <laughs> what about the transportation study? <laughs> what do you want to know about the transportation study? Do you need to see it again? No, I wasn't aware that we got the one for Redwood. <laughs> yes, we had that done when we were working on the bond stuff. So I can send that to you guys again. There was an we, were, we were doing one after the bond in preparation for the next bond. And we did have that done, yes. Okay. Well, I don't remember it. So yeah, you can refresh my memory on that. Okay. Can I can't do that right now because it's not right in front of me, but I can do it at the next meeting if you'd like me to. That'd be great. Was there, hey. Sherry, this is Member Wilkins. Wasn't there one James talked about at the South Y? The oh, city no. has had one done previously. I don't think they have a current one done. I know that there were, are a lot of concerns about the South Y just because oh, of no. the original planning of that and how it's not gone the way they thought it was going to go, and so there's lots of congestion out there. Okay. This is Member Durbin. I guess I would just kind of finish my thought from earlier before I was interrupted, which um, we did get to talking to a little bit of the specifics about Caveman Pool and understanding what the city is currently facing. Um, you know, Brian being um, a member of the Parks Committee already kind of being up to speed on what the city is looking at for the Caveman Pool property. Um, but we uh, received the information, um, at least Cassie and I did, to look over and start to understand what the implications of repairing that property might look like just to add to our knowledge for future discussions about other properties we may or may not go into partnership with the city on depending on what our district's needs look like going forward. I think that, that coming up with priority, or list of priorities as a board, as a whole, not just what we three can talk about. Or, you know, I mean, if there's long term, I think the property committee to me means long term vision and giving the city enough time to maneuver to, to improve a piece of property that we could do whatever. Um, or not just that, but just in general, I think it's, it's a longer term. Yes, I think our first addition item was the park leases, but I think that as a whole, I think this is starting a conversation as to what would be priority type, how to prioritize things that need to be done. Or, I mean, and I, I look to the, the elders who have been here longer, what, what have you seen that hasn't been, you know, Stratton Creek? Not that. Stringer gap. Stringer. Stringer gap. Or, you know, what are things that, um, I, I just look for your knowledge in this type of conversation. We can have the three of us newbies, and we can come up with all kinds of things. But what I would ask to think about what you guys might from experience to be able to see as a priority. Well, all I can really uh, 
remember that it was not really significant with it was always there and we didn't spend a lot of time talking about it quite frankly and we thought it probably would be there for some time so that's stringer gap uh, it's not really a factor in what you're talking about I think. Uh, you're talking about opportunity for our growth and expansion along with the growth expansion. And this is the first time really in years that I've heard open communication between the city and the school district. And I think it's wonderful. I'll get on the same page. But before it was kind of, well, turn the page, let's get on with other things. But, yeah, I mean, I think from a city's perspective, they should be looking at their growth and schools should factor in heavily how, how they perceive growth and where they're putting homes, and we should be a part of that kind of thing. So this committee that we have, this subcommittee, is, I think, extremely valuable. And really, that information then needs to go into our 20-year facility plan. Mm -hmm. What are we going to need in 10 years? Are we going to need new elementary schools out south or out west? Or you know, what do the urban growth boundaries look like? And that all is dependent on the city's plan for growth and where they're trying. So, I mean, these are big picture types of things 10 or 15 years down the road that we need to be working on. And, and the city already has that type of a, a plan in place. Um, and so, so they should be how sharing does that, that? How right? does that mesh with our plan? Or? So as a school board and as a school district, they should be sharing that plan with those individuals who need to know so that we can then create a school district to match And even, you know, bringing up the pool or, you know, other properties that might complete our square or, you know, what does that look like um, in terms of... Well, that, is, that in particular, the caveman pool, it's on people's, uh, in people's conversation right now, oh, what are we going to do? So now the opportunity is to get in their city and school district and figure it out and we've got people involved uh that can do that and if there's truly a need if there's a need there they recognize then we can resolve the way to handle it i'm kind of looking at brian a lot but i'm i'm also on the park board and some of these things come up so uh, yeah so let's go ahead Sorry? well and one thing you know, thinking about long-term planning and visioning is to keep in mind is that we have set school boundaries that um, are not dependent on the city. They're dependent on um, state laws, and we can't expand those boundaries without um, not only getting approval within our district, but within Three Rivers district. Those boundaries can't change without their approval also. And so that is a matter of what kind of blank spaces are in within our boundary. Um, and we, you know, in the past, you know, kind of done our best to keep track of that. And the former superintendent was on the Urban Growth Boundary Committee with the city. Um, so there is some, some connection there. But then, you know, as if the city of Grand Pass grows and, and multi-family units grow, then that's really our biggest um, opportunity for increased population. <coughs> because the single family areas of our district boundaries are pretty much so. Um, there's a few areas of growth, but, but not very many. Right, and I think that part of in bond discussions that we were, you know, unforeseen things in population studies like the hospital took a lot more over there than we thought, or we had a lot more growth on the north side. So just kind of opening that, that, those conversations up, I think is important. Um, and knowing. What, trans what transportation studies look like. I think mm -hmm. involving 
three rivers is probably not a bad idea either in that discussion um, when it does come to urban growth. And um, I dug around on the property, whatever, to layer map thing, and it was interesting to see where, because what is school, you have to have elementary school, it's 15 acres or 15 size. And kind of looking to where, but that's, that's why we talk to the city and other people. So. I think you're Debbie Pig, which is a field of creek with the best student apartments within high density apartments so we can have more students. No. <laughs> you did not hear me So, so, so yeah. Uh, Many good conversations now with the city over the past year. This one was even richer, and I think we look forward to continuing more of those. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think as a group, we felt we need to move forward with the right language um, from Bill Ransom to move forward with uh, leases of uh, Sherry. Were we going to put 20 or 30 years on them? Because we were that, pretty comfortable. That really doesn't die with my conversation with Tyler and Valerie of leases. The leases were the thing that keeps the city focused. And so, at least for Valerie's part, she was saying to have a move after the transportation studies and stuff come out to decide what language goes into the I think that Bill Ransom is addressing the language. Yeah. Well, also, Valerie and Tyler, they weren't in our meetings, so we don't really know. So, I mean, this is uh, Member Durbin. Sorry, Brian, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I'm a little confused as to why, what would be the reason to not uh, finalize these leases so the continued improvements can continue to happen at these properties and then if we're discussing some type of a land swap or other partnership opportunities, why getting leases executed would prevent um, those discussions from happening if it's in everybody's best interest to move forward. I, I guess I don't understand what, why string them along. Well, there didn't seem to be any urgency related to improvement for the park. So and that's least. where we heard differently, um, repurposing Gilbert Creek, they're going to decommission the softball field and then address some park, the parking lot over there. And Laura said, we'd like to execute the leases. So we were into it long term, and you heard that as well, Brian. Um, and so that there is improvements they have planned and in the works that they are, according to what we heard from Laura. So they're going to get rid of the softball field? Uh, they're doing something. Parks guys might know. We'll have to take the details off the floor. That's just what was related to us in the meeting. Because we, as a district, sometimes use those softball athletic fields, let's just say, at the parks for overflow stuff for the district. So if they're going to remove the athletic fields, that's kind of a horse of a different color. Well, for the jury, there's a lot. There's a lot that's gone on since you and I used to. Uh, we were aware of what was being done at Gilbert Creek Park. It's a whole new ball game now. Uh, they don't have any men playing softball anymore because they're afraid they'll hit the tennis players with the home runs. It's too short of a field, outfield. So that's why they're, and then of course the girls have this beautiful stadium here in the school uh, district has provided for them. And so they don't have the push for uh, needs to help with the, the girl softball team because um, they've got that covered. And then you also have uh, usage fields, right? Because of the virus, the fields out of Reinhardt Park are available too uh, for girls and uh, Boys play actually, and, and adults. And also, uh, since I was a vice principal at North Middle School going back um, 14 years, we have not used the softball field at Gilbert Creek. We, there's plenty of field space at North Middle School where they, they do their softball. I mean, yeah. So it's a new, it's a new generation. So 
Yeah, the only objection I hear, Gary, is that we use this as a as a way to continue to have the city engage with us. Yes. So but we, I mean, we could put things like they, I guess, I don't know, pick some number, like one that is a payment that they have to make so that every year they get a little wake up call that, hey, we're supposed to be working on this other project with the school district. I think you know, stuff like that. Sam said to PO might alter. Yeah, there's a lot of factors there. Um, yeah, so um, uh, if, if your theory is they won't engage with us on a, on a um, dollar a year lease, is that, do we really believe that we can engage with the city on a regular basis? That's, that's, that's right. right. That's right. Engage with the city we are on a dollar a year dollar that we get right. a payment I know, but I'm year. trying to clarify what he's saying. He's saying ask for more money so they take it seriously. It's, it's, Kind of what I'm well, I think over the years, I agree with Gary that uh, a couple of us raised our eyebrows every time the question about the usage of the property, school district property for city purposes for a dollar was a giveaway, and it upset some of our board members. They thought it was too cheap. It was too cheap for the city to do any number on it. I don't think that I share that feeling, maybe Gary doesn't either. But the whole thing is, you know, the dollars are all relative. And we're both involved in the city. Brian and I work city, we work school district, we're all in it together. And remember, that's the slogan these days, is we do much better together. And what I like is that we have a formal committee set up of people that are fairly new to the board, so they'll be here quite a while. And that's, a, that's the best idea. Have a long range look, help us with a long range plan, and try to work some equity in so future school board members don't get nervous if they're giving away the company store. So I admire what you're doing, but I think the rest of us have to let the three person committee guide us along with the superintendent and Give us reports on that. Um, I think the board as a whole is okay to move forward with preparing the lease for the site from Gary. From every conversation we've had about this, it really just seems like it's Gary bringing up these questions. And I appreciate that, but I don't know how, how much we need to rehash this again and again and again um, if everyone else thinks we should just you know, move forward with them as long as Bill Ransom gives us language in there that gives us an out. If we want to do something else, then there's, I don't really see any reason to string them along. And I have a bigger problem if we can't get a city council to work with the school district. I would agree without, with being, without having to hold them hostage to that. Like, if that's really the only thing that's keeping them to work with us, then we have bigger fish to fry because our city's going down the and I would, I would add that it complicates things with board members are talking to council members and having different discussions than the city manager is having with the superintendent. It really complicates this. Um, and so I, I agree with your comments. My sense of the overall sentiment of the board is to move forward with the leases with the appropriate language blessed by council. This is member Durbin. I agree with you, Kirk, and I would add to the discussion that if uh, we do run into a situation where we are running into roadblocks with furthering that discussion. The re one of the reasons why I wanted to see that Bill Ransom language added is that if we run into a roadblock enough times, then we'll just sell the property for money and the city will either have to put up or shut up and buy them or refuse them and then we'll be able to sell elsewhere. Not that that's, I mean, that's not where I think this is going to go, but that for me is kind of the you know, saving grace of adding that language in there. So that's how you quote unquote, keep them on the hook for having these discussions. But I am, am fully confident that the city will continue to engage with us as we're trying to put together our list of priorities and planning for what uh, future development for school sites and building developments and housing developments are gonna look like in the future. I think that it, it makes me feel comfortable hearing 
but but it has kind of always been a little bit of a hiccup or a pause um, because it caused myself the same hiccups and pause thinking, you know, we pay lots of money for other things that to the city that we need and they need. And so it didn't feel like a workable maybe relationship. Um, and so hoping that we can maintain a relationship or foster a relationship of communication with them um, would be my goal through all of this. But but it does make me feel good because I was like, what? Wait. Well, you've so. got great opportunities. You have um, the circumstance where the public works uh, is retiring now for the city. So you've got new people to deal with. Um, and so you can start off fresh with the three people we have and a superintendent right in the middle of it. And then they should have some of their new people that are going to be fresh too. And their city manager should better be right in the middle of it. And then those, that's, those are two viable forces that can combine and work miracles. And, yeah. Well, I'm just going to end appreciate the committee's report. I think we're all in agreement, at least most of us, on what we should do. So uh, thank you, Casey, for your report and for all those who have jumped in. Um, so we're going to go to our next item, which is 5.0 future meeting dates and suggested agenda wait, wait, items. Wait. Another different special concern. Sure. Um, Trish, in hearing, I can. So uh, I'm looking back at some of my old notes, and you are going to bring to a future board meeting a student GPHS schedule that aligned with an RCC associate's degree. How long ago was that in your notes? Wow. <laughs> yes, I do think that is true. I remember that. But I think March 13th happened, and my pre-COVID brain has escaped me. So thanks for reminding me. Okay. I'll put you down for future. Okay. Post-COVID. Is there such a thing? <laughs> there will be. There will be. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have uh, seen the um, video that the uh, district uh, and I put up on Facebook and um, the back to school video, and I think they are uh, nice um, tools to communicate with the community, and I appreciate the success. Brian, just one quick thing. Um, I was wondering if maybe Sherry could just give us like a really fast North Middle School update with with where that's at and maybe a timeline uh, for when it might be done? Sure. Um, for the seismic project, the B building is just about completed. Um, the C building is probably going to be closer to the end of next week. The main issues have been um, resolving some of the issues on the roof structure um, between um, ZCS and the architects and getting that information to the um, VITUS, the general contractor. So they've got that all done. They got that all settled. And so now they're pushing forward, getting the rest of that roofing work done. And then those two portions, the seismic portion of the project will be completed. So probably by the end of next week, you should see everything cleaned up and wrapped up. The um, classroom addition, that is going to be later in the fall, but we knew that going into the project that that was not going to be done um, in September. So you're probably looking at a couple of months down the road before that classroom addition portion of the project is done. And then at South Middle School, we've started the excavating out for the modulars. And so those are under construction at the company that does those. So we're um, on on target to get that project done as well. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, 
I'd like to share with the board that our superintendent did a very good job uh, on a virtual meeting with the uh, Rotary Club of France staff. And he has them in the palm of his hand, just like that. <laughs> All they have to do is get to know him. You know, it's loving. And I think that this is the communication that I just long for to continue and get enhanced and better. But we're talking about properties, we're talking about people. Uh, this is what we do. And uh, he's had a couple of opportunities lately in Rotary to put District 7's best foot forward. And he also one of them was with the Three Rivers Superintendent. And those two make a, a match as well, which is very significant. And not that it hasn't been that way all these years for different superintendents. But we need to encourage, I think, our superintendent uh, to make those connections and to maintain them so that they always, everybody else in the community knows what's going on because he makes sure of it. All right, any other special concerns or announcements? Thank you. All right, our future meeting dates. Uh, next one is going to be September 22nd at 5 p.m. And then after that is uh, October 13th at 5. So, any questions on those? All right, we're going to adjourn our regular session and we'll give a five minute break for those who need it and then we'll enter our executive session. I don't know what that was. But She's waiting for your gathering. I think I'll just shimmy. <laughs> You gotta use the bathroom that should be <laughs> We could just sell them the parks for ten bucks like we sold them the pool. <laughs> that was a that was a good deal on our end though. What? Sell them in the property for ten bucks? No, the pool. So Todd, can you uh, close out the regular session and then our team can join in the uh, executive session zoom? Yeah, I'm going to leave this session live. You guys can go ahead and close out of it there. And then Tanya can set up her session and we'll all log back into that one. And okay. then this one, people can just stay on. I'm going to, I have a little message I want to put on there. So let them know that we're in executive session. Okay.
We don't see them anymore. We're back. We can't even hear them. <laughs> I love that Tanya here said me. All right, well, we'll reopen our uh, general session with the approval of our three action items, which are listed under number 10, 10.1.1, 10.1.2, and 10.1.3. Approval of certified, classified, and certified MOU and MOA. So we have a motion to approve. So moved, member to Lagrange. Thank you. We have a second. I'll second it. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, Tony, can we have a roll call vote, please? Member Garvin? She may not have made it then. Member David Range? Yes. Member Brownell? Yes. Member Nelson? Yes. Member Coleman? Yes. Member Wilson? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. One more time for Member Garvin. She is not online at this moment. Okay. We have a quorum, so yeah. we'll assume that she will join with us in our sustaining vote. Okay, so the motion passes. Thank you. Um, we will adjourn our meeting. Thank you very much for your attendance. We'll see you on the 22nd. Good night, team. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. You too.